I always like to start like that. <laughs> that way you know I'm nuts to start with, but really I like to start because um, it's not one-sided. You know, people that are sign language impaired need an interpreter as much as someone who is deaf and needs to know what you're saying as a hearing person. So it's a two-way street. This is a, a family, the family of God. And into this amazing world, I was privileged to live for 20 years with a group of people who were sign language users. But I want to hasten to say out of the 30 million people in this country who have a hearing loss, only 2 million, maybe not even under 2 million, scantily under 2 million, use sign language for communication. So the vast majority of people who have a hearing loss of any kind, and there's all different kinds and many degrees of it, are people who don't use sign language and use a lot of different other ways of accommodation. And this is an amazing world. It's, it's a wonderful world. And I'm privileged to, to be a part of it for this part of my life. And now that I'm working with um, hearing people as a bishop, it's kind of unusual. If you're not a United Methodist, most people who become bishop don't work in a deaf church just before they become a bishop. Okay? Do you get that? God has just got a sense of humor. Okay, But um, Somehow in divine providence, I was elected bishop, so now I'm working with, I always say, hearing people who can't hear. <laughs> Prior to that, I was working with deaf people who can't hear, and so it's a very similar job. I just changed the, the office. I'm now in Philadelphia, where they talk funny, too, so we're just loving our life. So I'm going to do this and keep rolling here. Um, indeed, the body does consist not of one member, but of many. And in this quick overview, I gave you this so you don't have to write notes, but you can write notes on top of what I'm saying. But um, indeed, appreciate so much the plethora, the diversity amongst this community. There are people who live in deaf culture, folks with hard of hearing, world experience, the late deafened. That's a person who could always hear and then later in life, hearing loss onset. Deaf blind people, the Helen Kellers, uh, and deaf plus, plus, plus. And there are folks with deafness and other involvements, other disabilities. The deaf culture people, like I said, that was my world for 20 years. And indeed, I, I have to say I was attracted to it from the sign language. Isn't it beautiful? Don't you just love it when there's an interpreter and you kind of watch the interpreter and not the preacher and then they get mad? But it's... It's like another sermon. Even if you don't know sign language, you are seeing something very profound as you're hearing the words come across your ears. And indeed, that's how I got into this. I really am not deaf. I don't have a hearing loss. I actually am blind. I was born with just one eye, and I wear an artificial eye. So I think I was attracted to the disability world from my experience as a human, but the deafness just captured me because of the visuals of the language. And indeed, that is their hallmark. The deaf culture people consider themselves a language minority, a culture. They don't think there's anything wrong with them. As I said in the title, there's nothing wrong with my ears, I just can't hear. That was said to me very fluently in sign language by a very self-asserted, deaf culture, deaf pride man who, who wanted to remind me that you have your mouth and your ears, and I have my eyes and my hands, and we are equal. And from that day on, I've, I've never been the same. And indeed, that's the gift they bring to the disability community, is that lack of feeling disabled or, or just despise the label of disability. Um, very much a part of this community is also a supportive community. Deaf people in this sign language little world consider themselves one big family. And they know people all over the country. They, everywhere they go, they'll meet somebody that knows somebody. It's six points to Kevin Bacon. Well, they know somebody closer than that. They always know somebody. And indeed, they, they stick with each other in good times and bad. And they have their fights. I mean, I've seen them fight, and it's real ugly. The hands are flying, and you think, oh, they're just going to die. But they get through it because they're family. And they just have it out and keep living. And, it's a beautiful thing in a church to see supportive community. And they had their cultural values, and it's sort of like any other ethnicity group. The certain things are taboo, like if you want to go to the bathroom and you leave the room, you just don't go to the bathroom. You tell everybody what you're going to do. 
I mean, not specifically, but you, you tell them where you're going, okay? No one leaves a room without informing, because it's all community business, and it just disappear. Your, your body disappears when you leave a room. That's culturally not acceptable. Neither are flowers on the table in a restaurant, because those flowers will block the hands, and communication, full visual clarity is what's valued knowing what's going on is valued. So you get that flower phase on the floor. We've dropped more flowers that way. And they have this wonderful history that's charming and extremely uh, something to be proud of, of overcoming and finding a way where there is no way. And they are proud of their history and, and tell it well. And then, of course, the social networks go on forever. There's deaf racquetball teams and there's Deaf Olympics and everything imaginable is, is a part of the social network which, which gives life. The hard of hearing community is probably the most diverse of them all in terms of um, you can't just say well this group's here and this group's there. Sometimes the hard of hearing people use sign language, sometimes they don't. Um, they tend to identify with the hearing world and I'm, this, these are all generalities, forgive me uh, for being general because I know it's, there's no one way. But indeed, they have a tending to be an English form of orientation. The American Sign Language is not English. People with hearing loss tend to have heard English or are trained in English or have heard enough to get the flow of English enough in their ears that they function with an English grammar mindset. Um, they tend to use listening devices, hearing aids. Some folks have cochlear implants. Um, it's a world that's difficult because of the social circles. Um, deaf, hard of hearing people often tell me they feel stuck in the middle, that they don't fit anywhere. The hearing people don't understand them and they can't hear them very well. And the deaf people with their sign language, um, even if they can sign sometimes, they're still not fully accepted. They feel this sense of they won't let me in because I can hear. And it takes a real step of personal uh, integrity and tenaciousness for a hard of hearing person with sign language skills to be fully accepted in the, the deaf culture world because very often they, they emanate hearing value systems. It isn't so much the signs aren't good or that they have audiology, they have decibels that the totally deaf don't, but it's something about, this is a sign for it, it's called hearing mindedness. And hearing mindedness is a way of thinking and I can't in the short time to explain it very well, but just know that deaf culture people often reject those who are hard of hearing and it's very painful for the people stuck in the middle. The late deaf and folks, we have like tons of them in our churches, right? Our churches are, are graying and I think the average age in the I Methodist Church is 57. Well, with age comes loss of hearing. It's just a property of aging. It's just about the ears and how they age and over 65, the age of 65, about 30 percent of people have a hearing loss of some kind and some of them are very profound and it's something every church pastor really needs to take a good look at because they're in every church and a lot of times they're, they're, they're bluffing this, <laughs> they're not really uh, acknowledging it. But of course they strongly identify with the hearing world because they've been hearing all their life, you know, so what's not to want but become hearing again. And so the the big goal is to have technology and any kind of aid that will help whatever they can't hear become visual. And as I said, it's age related, but it's strongly connected with denial and withdrawal. And you'll see that when people miss enough times and someone will say to them, oh, I'll tell you later, or oh, it's not important, never mind, uh, you wouldn't understand. Uh, it starts building up inside. It's, it's a terrible pain to be left out of communication. It really makes people want to withdraw. Helen Keller, who was deaf and blind, once said, if I had to choose between being deaf or being blind, I'd be blind any day because deafness separates me from people. Blindness separates me from things. And I know you'd say the same, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you rather be in connection and community with humans than just be able to see things and be able to drive? And that's the experience of people who just can't hear. They get left out of all that wonderful personal stuff. And there's just a terrible sense of isolation. Uh, have you ever been in a restaurant where it's so noisy you want to die? Or you, you multiply that times a thousand, and that's the experience of a hard of hearing person or a late deafened person. The background noise is murder, especially if you have a hearing aid. 
It just makes everything loud. And they're just so isolated. They're in this room of talking, chatting, friendly people, all eating and having fun, and they're not getting what's being said. And they smile a lot and they bluff a lot, but it's so painful. It is so painful. So eat in quiet restaurants. That's the message. <laughs> Deafblind people, my true heart. When I went to get my doctoral ministry degree, I did my thesis on how do deafblind people experience God? And indeed, they are a real challenging group of people with a dual sensory loss. That means they, they miss out on things and human contact. And I call each one of them a snowflake because they have a unique set of givens, depending on how soon they became deaf and blind, if they became deaf first and blind second, how old they were, what kind of education they got, uh, what kind of support systems they had in their family, how much money they have in their pockets, uh, what state of the country they were lucky enough to be born in, because some states have wonderful deafblind services and some are really lousy. But indeed, it is a very severe loss because it, it makes you not only unable to communicate, but the mobility issue is there too because you, know, you can't be just walking down the street and you can't see. And even with a cane and good mobility skills, it's, it's tricky. So indeed, um, these folks have a lot of um, challenges and each one's different. But sense of touch seems to be something they all agree on. That lots of information comes from the hands. And indeed, I experienced in the deaf church that I served a whole row of deaf blind people. And in the row in the front, we had a, one interpreter and a deaf blind person with each deaf. So in other words, it was like a set of people with their hands on top of each other interpreting. And I called them deaf row. <laughs> and they had a, had a good time there because they would feel the word of the Lord. And you can feel the word of the Lord. You can smell it. You can touch it. You can taste it. You know, we're really bound by our hearing and our seeing, but you can use all the senses to worship God. And I could experience their, their tactile experience of God. They were sitting in the front row so I could feel it, and it was so powerful to me. But indeed, it is severely isolating, and the mobility challenges with it make it really hard for anyone deafblind to get to a church. Because you might get them in the door, but once they're there, they need that one-on-one -on -one interpreter who really gets tired after about 20 minutes because their hands are like sandbags sometimes. And then that means you need two. And then somebody else to take them to the bathroom and go to the coffee and get the donut and find the, the paper towel in the bathroom. I mean, this is really heavy-duty support system. But they're just the greatest people on earth. Finally, the deaf plus, plus, plus as folks with other kinds of challenges, mobility, intellectual, physical, um, each one like a snowflake is unique with their communication, their education, their mobility. Um, sometimes I've found the, the communication is extra hard when you have plus, plus, plus because, um, for example, if you have cerebral palsy and you're deaf, it's hard to sign because it's just jerkier and harder to read it and then you, you become isolated from your own deaf friends because they don't understand your sign language because it's hard to read, that kind of thing. So it has a lot of pieces to it, but certainly um, there's a lot of deaf plus plus pluses because of the world we live in with a lot. Of, the pathologies of deafness have changed radically in this country. Like we had like rubella, German measles, high fever diseases, a lot of the old timers in my church were people who became deaf at the age of two when they got measles or meningitis. High fevers destroy the little hair cells in your ear. And that bunch of people went to the deaf school and they learned sign language and they stayed buddies and they married each other and got divorced from each other and got married to somebody else. But they all stayed in their little pack of friends, okay? Later now, we, we got rid of measles, right? We got the shots, so we're not having those pathologies. Instead, we're having like fetal alcohol syndrome and drug-related things and kind of sad things. And so a, a child born to an alcoholic mother may not just be deaf, but deaf plus, 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 plus. And with each one of those pluses adds another layer of isolation and, and ministry opportunity. The church has not been particularly good about all this. Starting with Augustine, for what great fault innocence is born blind, sometimes born deaf, which blemish indeed hinders faith. Where does he come from? As the witness, the apostle says, faith comes by hearing. How sad. Doesn't that make you want to cry? Faith comes from hearing. Have you ever heard God talking to you? I mean, maybe you have, but it's rare, right? You hear God in your heart, 
So like God isn't big enough to speak to somebody's heart. And this saint, God love him, he thought that it's because they couldn't hear. It's too bad they just can't go to heaven because they, oh, what great sadness he felt for people who were deaf because they couldn't hear and be saved and take the sacraments. And so the church started out on a bad foot there. And then uh, it didn't improve too much with time. And I must say, there's precious little scholarship on any early deaf anything in the church. It's just nothing there. In 686, 600 years after the church started, we, we have a story of John of Beverly, who is a, a priest, a monk, who met a deaf boy, and he prayed for him, and he became hearing. And this was a great moment in the Man, the boy's life, obviously, because he began to talk and hear. But that was um, a hearing-based model, you know. Because he came over to the other side and got hearing, then that fixed him. And that's what the message was. You need to get fixed. Be like us. And then the rest of these efforts, which I don't want to take the time to explain, were, were Renaissance sort of days when education for everyone became popular, including the common person and education would lift up humanity, and uh, enlightened thinking came into play, and even special education began during the Renaissance. And all these early founders of deaf schools were very much in favor of a couple things. One is they wanted the person to read and write and understand enough to be saved. The whole point is the salvation of the soul, which I'm not against. I'm, I'm all for that. But that was like the main deal. You, you get enough language so you can accept Christ as your Savior and be born again and go to heaven when you die. Second motivation, not nearly as pure, was money. <laughs> you see, the um, monarchs in the, those days would tend to marry into each other. <laughs> and sometimes there would be like a, a genetic strain that kept popping up with the same bloodline and so a lot of the heirs were deaf and in those days if you didn't have speaking you were not considered human and so you had to teach junior how to speak so that he could inherit the family money and become the heir to the family money so that's awful but a lot of these schools were started by rich monarchs who wanted their kid to speak so that they could become able to become human and be like us and get the money. And also these schools were very expensive, cost a lot of money. It was very, very profitable to set up a school. But they were all oral. Teach them how to talk and lip read and become like us. And that was the thinking. You just have to be like us because after all, we're, we can hear, so we're normal. And if you can't talk, then you're not normal. And so that is the premise of most early education. Until we meet Abbe de la Paix. This was a priest in the 1700s in France who was not much of a priest. In fact, he was kind of a loser and he was appointed to the worst parish in the, in the state by his bishop who didn't like him. And in this parish, way back in the mountains, was this little lady who had two deaf twin daughters. And these daughters were um, smart little chicks, but they were signing to each other because they had nothing to do all day, so they invented sign language among themselves. And he met them when they were teenagers and had a pretty good language going. And this mother appealed to the priest and said, please, I want my daughter to have the sacraments. I want them to be saved, but they do not speak. Can you help them? Can you teach them about God? And so he said, yeah, sure. So he went into this house and met these girls, and they taught him sign language, okay? And he was like born again. He was like, oh, this works. They can see this language. Sign, uh, lip reading just doesn't do it. There's contests about lip reading, and the best lip readers in the country can only get 35% of what's being said. Now, would you like to miss 60% of the world? Lip reading is hard. Turn your television off sometimes and watch Walter Conkite or somebody. You know, it's, it's really hard to guess what's said unless you can hear something. And sometimes hearing cues from a hard of hearing ear can help lip reading. But totally deaf person, lip reading is not successful. These gals were totally deaf. They knew sign language. They taught him. He had the good sense to start a deaf school where everything was manual using their sign language. And the school just took off because it was working. People who learned sign language then could read and write and understand and not have to guess what's being said and it was just cool. And so this school was in Paris. Meanwhile, back in America where there was mostly 
trees and forests. There was a pastor named Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet, who was a parish priest, and he was living in Hartford, Connecticut, where there was a rich man named Cogswell, and his daughter, Alice, became deaf from measles. And he was so upset. His daughter couldn't go to school. He, she couldn't hear. She couldn't be like the other kids. But he had money. So anyway, he went to church one Sunday and said, my daughter can't hear. And the pastor, Thomas said, okay, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I can help her. And so he goes to help her. And he realized that she was real good with visuals. And she wasn't much with lip reading. So he started ma making up little signs for her. And they were like panamining and stuff, and, and Cogswell said, yeah, this is a bright chap. We've got to send him to Europe. He can learn how to set up a school, and we'll, we'll make a school, a deaf school in America. So indeed, Cogswell got all his buddies together. They gave him money, and they sent Thomas to England on a boat, and there was an oral school there. And that oral school uh, wasn't real keen on him because he was American, after all, and the Revolutionary War hadn't been over that long. <laughs> And so they weren't really dying to see him. And after all, we have our secret methods. And we are going to charge you money to learn our methods. And you must stay for many months. And he didn't have any money. And he didn't have many months. And he was very downcast and thought he'd been sent here for nothing. And that was when Abbe de la Paix school was doing a, a show. This school was taken over by Abbe Sicard after the death of de la Paix. And Sicard. Uh, was not in the right place during the French Revolution. So to kind of get away from his head getting cut off, he, he traveled around Europe doing programs about how deaf people can learn using sign language. And he would set up a little arena, and people would come and watch how the deaf can learn. And so it just happened. He was in England when Gallaudet was there. It's a God thing. And he, Gallaudet, saw the Sicard show and said, this is what I want. And he rushed up to this abbe and said, can I come to France and learn your methods? And he said, sure, because French people liked American people back then. And so, and they still do, but they liked them better than English after the, the war, you know, all that. Anyway, so he goes to France and he sees this wonderful school where not only they're using sign language, they have deaf teachers the deaf are in the driver's seat and empowered to be in charge. What a concept. And so he kind of got real friendly with one of the teachers and talked him into coming back to America and starting a deaf school. And that was indeed our first deaf school in 1817 in Hartford, Connecticut, the American School for the Deaf. It still is there. So indeed, we got sign language there. And we also got our first deaf church, St. Anne's Episcopal Church, which was founded by Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet's son, who was an Episcopal priest. Implications. The church has not done a wonderful job. <laughs> like we've done a pretty bad job. <laughs> like we still do a pretty bad job. Because now that I'm a bishop, I get to go to a different church every Sunday. Okay, and I've been there two years, so do the math. I've been to 100 churches. Guess how many churches I've seen with people who use sign language? Two. <laughs> two out of 100. That's really sad. But I do have to say that some churches do have listening devices and they have captioning and some visual cues for people who don't use sign language. So that, that's good. But majority of our churches pretty much expect everybody to hear the word of the Lord or you're kind of left out. And the other implication that's kind of sad is that we tend to think you got to get fixed. And that like was alluded to in our last talk, you got to kind of get to the medical model and get healed and get straightened out and be like us and then you're okay and then you'll really have communication. Also the church very often aligned its efforts toward the deaf and hard of hearing as a salvation thing, as an answer to the Great Commission, go thou and preach the gospel to all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And of course, that is our goal, and I'm not demeaning that so much as to say um, sometimes there's more to it than just get them fixed, get them saved, you know. Get them fixed and get them saved, and then we're off the hook, you know. Because that makes deaf people the subjects of service, our mission, a paternalistic smell in the air. Do you get that? That is not very empowering if you're deaf, to know that the hearing have to help you. There's a famous deaf organization whose slogan is, they've lost their hearing. Must they lose their salvation too? And I know they meant well with that, but it's, you know, it's 
They've got so much to give us. Deaf people have gifts and graces for ministry without which the body of Christ is not complete. And so for the church to just leave it as we fix them, we give them a sign language interpreter, we make sure they know Jesus, and we take care of them. It's just like, you know, this much of what it's all about. We have other ways we can do this better. Indeed, deaf culture people do not see themselves as disabled. And they do not want you to fix them. In fact, they don't want to take a pill and wake up the next morning and become hearing. They've said to me, if you give me that pill, I'll spit it out. And when they spit it out, they spit on you. <laughs> They're so adamantly against it. Have you ever heard of cochlear implants? That is a new surgery that's really, like in the last 10 years, has just catapulted into the whole world of the deaf particularly the signing world, it's going to be changed forever because of it. But essentially, it's an artificial organ of hearing that is implanted in the brain. I mean, you have to bore a hole in the head and put this in, and then they always wear this processor that helps the ear or this, this cochlea, this artificial cochlea, know how to hear. And then along with this surgery comes many, many, many months of therapy where you learn how to hear with it. You learn what that means. This sound means this. And this is highly controversial with the culturally deaf community because to them, as soon as a baby at 11 months is implanted, which is what they're recommending, 11 months is the, the best time because that way they get as much hearing as they can, as early as they can, and as long as you wait, the more they've missed out. So the deaf culture people say if they implant this child at 11 months, then they'll never be going to a deaf school. They'll be going to an oral program where they are mainstreamed with the hearing kids and everybody's talking and there isn't as um, a good chance to use sign language nor be involved in the deaf culture, which they value and they think is precious and they feel it's a lot more easy to understand sign language than to lip read and guess what this artificial ear is doing for you. There's a lot of opinions on this. I'm not taking their side or anybody's side, but indeed it's... Deaf culture would say, it's okay not to hear. You know, you just get by with our visuals, and that's what's important. And indeed, with people who are deaf culture, we have to see that worship is visual. And it is visual good for all of us, right? Unless you're blind, and then you need to hear but or to touch. But we all benefit from a visual worship. I know I do. I just think... Worship can really be boring unless you can see something. That's why I love all these PowerPoint things we have now. They, they really accentuate what I'm hearing. And deaf culture people also want to be included in such a way that the co communication access is for all. So the interpreter will not be a pair of hands of a nice lady standing there running her hands real fast so that the deaf can understand. But that the deaf will participate as well with their signing and that same interpreter will voice what's being said for you all who don't know the sign language, if you don't know sign language. It's always good to learn it. If you have a chance, please do learn it. It comes in very handy when you're scuba diving or something. But it's definitely a, a two-way street here. Deaf culture people want you to know that you're as impaired as they are, and you're not doing us a big favor by fix, fixing this and bringing in the interpreter. The interpreter's gonna work for you too as a sign language impaired person and that the deaf people have a gift of tenacity and communication and resourcefulness that are, are parts of the body that, that hearing people need. We need this folk, not to serve, but to include and to empower. The heart of hearing laid deaf and people also want inclusion, but they definitely want technology that will help accentuate any remaining hearing they have and make clear what they're they're hearing still, and again, visuals are really important. Churches that are doing this right will include copies of the sermon. That means you can't write it on Saturday night, and if you do, you better <laughs> copy it real quick and pan, hand it out on Sunday morning. And CART is a kind of assistive-like device where 
the stenographer is typing every word and the words flash up on the wall. So it's, it's real time. It's exactly what's being said. It immediately becomes English text. That is so delightful to have that because then even people who aren't paying attention can look up and catch what they missed. You know, It's good for all of us. And you have this wonderful text of everything that happened. So CART is a real luxury. It's not cheap, but it's a wonderful thing to have. And deaf, blind, I mean deaf culture people and hard of hearing, like deaf and people, all benefit from good communication, such as making sure the lighting is good so visuals are easily accessible. The seating in the front is very important. And just the lip reading basics are important. Even deaf culture people do have to lip read sometimes. And if you teach people about, you know, don't put your hand over your mouth, and the, the mustaches have got to go. <laughs> They hate your mustaches and just chewing gum while you're talking or turn your head or, or standing. The, the great killer is standing in front of a, a light. Because if you stand in front of a light, you become a silhouette. And I had a horrible, what time is it? I have a minute. I have this horrible story where I was at a funeral. Where I was interpreting for a person who died who was deaf. And his family came and they didn't know him at all because he was deaf and went to deaf school and they never knew him. but. When he died, they figured they should show up. So here these people were kind of scared to death in this, in this funeral with their dead brother who they'd never really know. And, and the dead brother, all his buds were there. I mean, it was a rocking party. Funerals were deaf people. They stay all day. They talk all day. The only way to get rid of them is turn the lights off. And then, then they go outside and they, they talk some more. So here I am interpreting for the things that are being said, and I'm voicing what the deaf people are saying, because also at every deaf funeral you must have a lot of stories. He did this, and he did that, and I mean the stories are wonderfully, wonderfully heartwarming and sometimes a little scary, but they all got up in front of this big lamp. Funeral homes have these archaic old looking lamps sometimes, kind of Victorian architecture. Well, every deaf person stood in front of this lamp and they were signing away this funny, funny story about this dead brother. I couldn't see them. They just turned into a silhouette because they were, uh, the light was behind them and I'm supposed to voice. Here are these family who never knew this man and I've got to, i got to say what, what he was really like and I couldn't see it. You know, so I'm like, get over here. <laughs> I kept moving them away from that lamp so I could see because it really is important to not have light behind you. So good communication is important and so is, of course, supportive community. It gives life. There's nothing like friends. It is, it's life itself when you're left out to have somebody with you, seeing you as normal, not as broken, needing fixed, and part of the family. The deaf, blind, deaf plus plus people need support service providers, like I said, people who drive them to church, go, go to the coffee mug and all that stuff, as well as the communication access. Uh, Braille is a friend of deafblind people because it is a, a tactile form of communication, so access with Braille bulletins is often helpful. Um, sometimes folks who are low vision benefit from large print. That's easy to get now with our computers. Um, audio description sometimes is helpful for people who are blind and hard of hearing, who, who still can hear enough to, if they could just hear you, somebody whisper in their ear what's going on, that will help them know what's happening. And of course the architectural access is very important for those who are deaf plus plus. And respite, I do need to add that word. Folks that are in um, a pretty involved life with deafness and blindness, um, there's somebody in their life that kind of looks after them in some way, either a cadre of friends or a family member or a, um, sometimes they're just social workers that are real dear people that hang in. They need a break. They need a break sometimes. And that's something the body of Christ could do so well is, is just provide respite for family members that need a break and need to do something else on a weekend or regularly to, to get the strength they need to continue the work. Very important. But what does deaf community want the most? Empowerment. Isn't that what you want? Don't your gifts and graces want to be used? Would you like somebody to always be helping you and fixing you and trying to save you and then leave the room? I mean, you want to be empowered to let your gift shine. And how can this happen? Well, of course, we want to be culturally sensitive and understand that um, 
it's okay to be uncomfortable and have someone standing up there preaching who's not speaking and accept that as normal, just as your talking is normal, signing without a voice is normal. Um, be theologically open to the, the voices of the margins. And then to help to remove the barriers of people to become pastors. And that is the great Waterloo. Pastors who are deaf. There's only two in the I Methodist denomination. Two. And it's because it was so hard to get in. We had to become hearing. You had to become like the hearing world to make it in. Um, they had to explain a million times to a million people what it was like. And it's, it's just very difficult to be a pastor in a, deaf, in a hearing congregation if you're deaf. And it's, it's just hard to find the funding for all the access and all the acceptance. We put up a lot of barriers. And they include attitudinal barriers. We say, oh, you know, they're just disabled, you know. And we feel sorry for them. And, and we know we've got to help them, but they're a lot of trouble. And this attitude is always there, the stigma. And then there's the financial thing. All that money for one interpreter? Wesley Theological Seminary spent $16,000 for an interpreter for one seminary student for one semester. Yes. Don't they rock? They budgeted sixteen grand. How many seminaries would do that? But they said, this person's valuable. They are a gift to the church. We're going to make sure she knows what's happening. Um, lack of patience. Sometimes it just takes a lot of slowness. It's slow. Sometimes you have to wait. It takes a little longer to process. But we're just so impatient. Fear of the unknown. Sometimes people just won't even talk to deaf people because they're just afraid of them. They're really afraid of them, and deaf people think that is so silly. But you, you get embarrassed, you don't know what to say, you don't know sign language, and then you just walk away because you're afraid of them. You're afraid of looking uncomfortable or looking inadequate. And then, unfortunately, our, our majority culture values that say the brightest and best, the hearing, the physically capable, the smart, the, that's who we want. That's who we want to ordain. That's who we want to be in, in our churches. Uh, God never was about the brightest and the best. God chooses the likes of us, and we know we're not. So indeed, I'm very privileged to have Brian here today. He is a, tea, a class member, and I've asked him to just take the last few minutes and just tell his story a little bit. He has a hearing loss, and one of my big pains of coming here was feeling very hypocritical that I don't have a hearing loss, and here I am speaking for deaf people. It's a big no-no in my book, and yet this, my life wouldn't allow me to do otherwise, and I am privileged to ask Brian to share a few things. We talked this morning, and I thought he had a wonderful testimony about his life as a person with a hearing loss. So, Brian, you can finish up the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for um, voicing much of what needed to be said. Well, my name is Brian Snow. I was born with treacher Collins syndrome in American Fork, Utah. I have artificial eardrums and through a series of surgeries can hear out of this year with the help of a hearing aid. My experience in um, churches and other social groups was oh, like I said earlier, needed to be fixed, or the one who needed to have prayer so that his ears can be fixed, and kind of very much, you know, felt sorry for all that. Um, I think my own personal healing was in when I attended a church that was spiritually and emotionally inclusive and not just, oh, we have all the right technologies to help you out or we'll have um, things, you know, written out for you. No. In fact, this church was kind of behind in its physical inclusiveness. <laughs> they're, they're getting there. <laughs> but what I think was helpful was just for me and in the CPE program with Paul Derrickson and Angie Van Heis was seeing myself as fearfully and wonderfully made as I am. And in my own religious context, sharing my spiritual and emotional journey and interacting with people 
as people and seeing all of us in need of healing. Because I see even if you don't have a disability that is obvious or recognized by society, we all in our experiences are disabled and we all are in need of healing in some way. Thank you.